If you're someone who has thyroid disease, then today's video titled Medications and Supplements That Can Affect Your Thyroid Levels is going to be super important for you. And hopefully with this information that I'm going to share with you, you and your doctor will be able to better manage your thyroid disease and minimize those thyroid symptoms. I'm Dr. Hagmeyer, and I'm the clinic director here at drhagmeyer.com, where we help patients from around the world find answers and solutions to their chronic thyroid problems using functional medicine and clinical nutrition. Today's information is so important because the vast majority of people with thyroid disease, they continue to struggle with symptoms like brain fog and depression and anxiety and hives, chronic pain, hair loss, weight gain, despite taking their thyroid medication. And while there are many reasons for this that I discuss in other videos on my YouTube channel, today I want to focus in on the different medications and the different supplements that can affect your thyroid levels. You see, overlooking these medications can not only affect your thyroid hormone levels, but in, this, in a way, they can lead to you being over-medicated with thyroid hormones. Now, there's four or five main ways that medications and even vitamin supplements can affect your thyroid levels. And so some medications can interfere with thyroid function or thyroid production um, simply by, by altering the amount of thyroid hormone that's being produced in the thyroid gland. Some medications can, in, can interfere with the release of thyroid hormones from the actual thyroid gland itself. Some medications uh, can impact the way uh, thyroid hormones are absorbed. And finally, some medications interfere with the way your liver takes T4 and it converts it into T3, right? So those are different ways that the medications that very often people with thyroid disease are taking can actually cause more thyroid problems and, and more difficulty managing thyroid disease. So let's jump into this. Number one on my list of, of medications that can affect thyroid levels are going to be your antacid medications. And the reason for this, or I should say, you know, when it comes to antacids is that many times digestive problems such as GERD and acid reflux and bloating and, and you know, again, with thyroid disease, they often go hand in hand. We often see patients that have thyroid problems often suffer with these symptoms. In fact, most patients who have thyroid problems for literally any length of time, eventually at some point will go on to develop acid reflux, will go on to develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which classic symptoms include bloating, um, constipation, diarrhea, and so forth. And so again, getting control of these symptoms becomes very, very important. Now, as a result of these symptoms, patients, you know, out of desperation, they begin taking antacids, they begin taking proton pump inhibitors, they take things like Prilosec, they take Zantac, they take Nexium. And what many people fail to realize is that these drugs not only impact the absorption of your thyroid hormone medication, but they also impact the absorption of many critical vitamins and nutrients that you need to have healthy thyroid function. So in a sense, you get this vicious cycle going on and you, the patient, gets caught in the middle you go on developing more symptoms in which your doctor prescribes more medications, right? So what I find in the vast majority of my thyroid patients is that their symptoms of acid reflux and GERD are not caused by an excess of acid, uh, which you've been told probably and what you've been led to believe, but rather uh, this is caused by a deficiency of stomach acid or a problem with the pH of the gut. You see, low stomach acid is really one of the most common causes, it's one of the most common reasons behind small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And with that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, very often we get that acid reflux, we get that belching, we get that bloating. Now, another common scenario is an H. pylori infection, right? You know, if you've been watching and been around my YouTube channel for any length of time, I did uh, quite a bit of videos talking about H. pylori, right? And so if you suffer with these symptoms that I just mentioned, Number one is go back and watch those videos that I've done on H. pylori and thyroid disease. Number two is get tested for H. pylori. And number three is get tested for SIBO, right? These are some of the most common infections that we see over and over again with patients with hypothyroidism and Graves' disease and Hashimoto's, right? So those are just some things to think about. The other thing that I would want you to know uh, about uh, long-term use of these antacids, and when I say long-term, I'm talking about longer than eight months, you know, anything longer than six months, you know, you're, you're going to create problems. And so that not only do these antacids impair thyroid hormone absorption, uh, what we often find is that these antacids also cause deficiencies in many of your B vitamins. And one specifically that I often test for, uh, or maybe your doctor has even tested you for, is a B12 deficiency, right? Now, let me ask you something. Can you relate to brain fog? Check. Can you relate to severe fatigue? Check. 
Can you relate to balance issues, right? Can you relate to numbness in the hands or in your feet? Uh, do you have a shortness of breath, right? If you answered yes to any of these, your antacids could be contributing to a B12 deficiency. So what else do you need to know about uh, antacids? Well, number one is if you use any of these, now it's recommended that you wait at least one to two hours after you've taken your thyroid replacement to take them. But ultimately, you should address the, the, the intestinal issue, the gut issue, not covered up with antacids and Nexium and Prilosec and, and all those other you know, medications. So let's talk next about uh, the role that iron uh, has on the effects of your thyroid levels. One of the most common metabolic imbalance, uh, imbalances that patients with thyroid disease and autoimmune thyroid disease have, Hashimoto's disease, is an iron deficiency, right? Uh, low stomach acid, heavy menstrual cycle, gastrointestinal bleeding, H. pylori, ulcers, celiac disease, SIBO, inflammatory uh, uh, bowel, uh, bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, being on vegan or vegetarian diets, these are all common causes in behind an iron deficiency. So again, some things to think about. Um, if we take a look at the symptoms of iron anemia, again, these are very, very similar to those that I just mentioned with a B12 deficiency. Symptoms of iron anemia are also very, um, very uh, similar to hypothyroidism, right? So here's the problem though with anemia and thyroid disease, right? Once you are anemic, not only do you not have enough red blood cells in your body, but now the size of your red blood cells becomes smaller. Red blood cells carry oxygen to all the different tissues of your body. So if you don't have enough red blood cells or the ones that you do have are smaller than they should be, their ability to deliver oxygen is compromised. And to the person with thyroid disease or Hashimoto's, not only does that iron anemia cause fatigue, but that iron anemia actually will exacerbate your hypothyroidism because iron anemia impacts a very, very important enzyme that helps you make thyroid hormone. I've talked about this, this uh, enzyme quite a bit. It's called thyroid peroxidase. Now again, here's why this is important. I'm going to review this again. Thyroid peroxidase is one of the primary enzymes that is needed to make thyroid hormones. This enzyme uses both iodine and it uses iron in order to make your T3 and T4 thyroid hormones. In fact, studies show that when a person is iron anemic, that anywhere between 30 to 50% of a decrease in thyroid peroxidase activity can occur when you have that iron deficiency. Again, you don't want to be iron anemic, right? Um, so again, if you correct this uh, iron deficiency anemia, your thyroid hormone production is going to improve. You're going to need less thyroid medication, again, because your thyroid peroxidase activity is improved. It's more efficient. So again, uh, just a reminder uh, to be sure to get your thyroid levels monitored more frequently if you have an iron deficiency. Remember, again, any, supplement, uh, any supplemental thyroid hormone that you're getting from your medication plus the improvements in your thyroid peroxidase activity could potentially increase your levels. So again, monitor those levels throughout that time period and make sure that your levels uh, stay balanced. The next thing I wanna to talk to you about is something called biotin, right? Oh, why biotin, right? High levels of biotin, also known as vitamin B7 or vitamin BH is super important and here's why. One of the most common, common symptoms that women struggle with and can be quite debilitating emotionally is losing hair, right? Um, but in addition to losing hair, uh, biotin deficiency can cause nails to become weak and they can cause your um, nails to become brittle. Um, your skin it becomes dry, it cracks, it loses its youthfulness. And so what, are many, what do many women do, right? They, and I completely understand this, is they go to the internet and they, they search and they ask Dr. Google, what, oh my gosh, what are the natural supplements that I can take to help my hair loss and to help, you know, grow healthy skin, healthy nails? And what pops up? Biotin. Otherwise, known again as vitamin B7. So again, you want to check your, perhaps your B complex, your B vitamin that you might be taking to see if it has biotin in it. And again, biotin is one of those vitamins that uh, helps with hair, it helps with skin, it helps with nails. Uh, and in fact, it does such a great job with these things, but the problem is, is that what if your biotin levels are, are low? Uh, what, I'm sorry, what if your biotin levels are, are not low? What if they're normal? 
and you start taking biotin. And higher doses of biotin are problematic for a couple reasons. Um, especially if you have high levels of biotin for prolonged periods of time, biotin can actually uh, make your blood work look like you have hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease. Uh, so again, um, this is something important because this can, of course, skew your thyroid levels. This is going to lead to, again, um, you being um, your medication being mismanaged. So again, think about think about it like this. You go into your doctor's, uh, you know, you go in for your doctor's appointment. You don't, you've been taking biotin. Your doctor doesn't know you've been taking biotin. And so they run some blood work on you and your thyroid levels come back skewed, right? That's going to be a problem in terms of, of managing those levels. So not only does biotin interfere with thyroid markers, biotin can skew your cortisol levels. It can skew your parathyroid hormone levels, which affect your calcium levels. It can, it can skew your ferritin levels. But that's not all. Biotin can affect your vitamin D levels, your B12, your folate. So again, what I always recommend is, is that patients um, be aware of what you're taking, right? As far as you, the supplements that you're taking, uh, even check your, your multivitamins, right? And again, if you're taking anything that contains biotin, again, B7, you want to stop that anywhere between three, four, or five days uh, prior to having tests done. Now, there's another common medication women use. Um, younger generation in, in one respect, and then uh, in another respect, um, a medication and a replacement, a hormone replacement that a lot of women use during menopause, right? We're talking about birth control pills, we're talking about HRT, and we're talking about these high doses of synthetic estrogens. Now, if you are taking thyroid medication uh, and you're also on the pill, I want you to know that these hormones, uh, these hormone replacements, these estrogens, can really affect your thyroid in a bad way. Estrogen that comes from the pill uh, can increase something called thyroid binding globulin. Right? Now, thyroid binding globulin is one of the markers that I run in a complete thyroid panel. And here's why this marker is so important to understand. First off, when thyroid binding globulin levels increase, right, when they go up right, because of estrogen, you don't have as much thyroid hormone floating around in your blood. So you experience many hypothyroid symptoms. If you're a woman who is taking the pill, did you notice that when you began taking the pill that you gained weight? Did you notice more hypothyroid symptoms? In other words, did your hypothyroid symptoms intensify? Did you have more fatigue? Did you have more depression? Did you have more anxiety? Did you have more brain fog? Did you have more stomach bloating? Right? These are all very, very common symptoms that women experience when they first start taking the pill uh, or if they've been on a pill for any longer than, than 12 months. If you're taking birth control pills and uh, you're using estrogen replacement therapy because you're menopausal or you, maybe you've had a hysterectomy and you're concerned about the effects that estrogen has on your thyroid, you may want to watch a video that I did titled The Pill and Thyroid Disease, right? Um, again, you want to make sure that your levels are, are staying where they should be, right? So another medication I want to talk to you about that's on my list here is your dopamine agonists, right? Um, again, these are very, very common uh, for men and women with thyroid disease to be on. And again, uh, they're often on these because dopamine agonists are drugs that are designed to increase the level of dopamine in the brain. Uh, these drugs can uh, be often be prescribed because of clinical depression, which a lot of people with uh, thyroid disease suffer with. They can be prescribed to uh, young adults, uh, adults with ADHD, or even kids with ADHD. They can be prescribed to people that have Parkinson's disease. They can be prescribed to even people with restless leg syndrome or RLS. Sometimes women with high prolactin levels, uh, like uh, that seen with women who have either a tumor uh, in their brain, uh, such as a prolactinoma, or women who have PCOS, all right? Um, they can often, all these scenarios are, are situations where um, if you have thyroid disease, that these medications can, can intensify and these medications can make your thyroid levels look even worse. Again, dopamine agonists are often used to treat high prolactin levels. And that's again because dopamine levels lower your prolactin. Uh, but these drugs also lower your TSH levels. So if you have TSH levels that come back, Keep that in mind. Dopamine can suppress your TSH. Another way of saying that is high dopamine can make you more hypothyroid. Uh, and this can take already an existing symptoms of hypothyroidism, such as fatigue and weight gain and depression, 
brain fog, daytime sleepiness, hair loss, and anxiety, and make you, again, more hypothyroid, right? So high dopamine lowers your TSH. So you feel worse when you take these drugs or that are purposefully you know, designed to increase your dopamine levels. Another drug uh, that you'll find in almost every American's uh, house in their medicine cabinets are NSAIDs. Right? These are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Right? Many people who have Hashimoto's disease and thyroid, uh, thyroid disease, they also suffer with some kind of chronic pain. Maybe they have rheumatoid arthritis. Maybe they have psoriatic arthritis. Maybe they have fibromyalgia. Uh, maybe they use NSAIDs because they have frequent menstrual cramps or chronic headaches. Uh, and rather than addressing the root cause of the chronic pain and the headaches and the menstrual cramps, they turn to using these NSAIDs, right? Do you find yourself using aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, naproxen, Motrin? Are you using these on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, right? If you do, you're hurting your thyroid. Not only are these pain relievers hurting your thyroid, these pills cause leaky gut, they cause intestinal inflammation, they cause ulcers, they cause bleeding, they cause heartburn, they cause gas, they cause bloating, and the list goes on and on and on. And many times, uh, these medications will actually also lower your TSH levels, as well as lowering your T4 levels. Now, why don't you take a look at this, right? Uh, you can see here that with the conclusion of this study that was published in the American Journal of Medicine, several NSAIDs can lower serum thyroid concentrations by affecting the binding of T4 and T3 to serum to serum carrier proteins. This is what I was just talking about earlier when I, I was talking about thyroid binding globulins, right? So the NSAIDs, the medication that you're taking for chronic pain is another potential reason for altering the way thyroid hormones are distributed throughout your body, right? Again, that thyroid binding globulin, that's a carrier protein. So the next medication that I want you to be aware of that can affect your thyroid levels, uh, and this really isn't um, this can be considered a medication when it's prescribed, uh, you know, but it's really a hormone. Uh, most, if, if not all, women with thyroid disease or Hashimoto's suffer with some kind of sex hormone imbalance, right? They have, uh, very often, they either have too much or they have too little testosterone. These might be women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome. These might be women who are insulin resistant. Uh, these could be women uh, that are in menopause or perimenopause. Again, these are all conditions that are super common in women with low thyroid, uh, low thyroid um, or, or Hashimoto's disease. If your testosterone levels are high, let's say because of PCOS or because of insulin resistance or perhaps because you're taking too much testosterone replacement, you will have problems with, again, that carrier protein, that thyroid binding globulin. Earlier in the video, I spoke about how oral contraceptives and patches and HRT, the birth control pill, I said those all increase thyroid binding globulin. Testosterone does just the opposite, right? Testosterone actually lowers the thyroid binding globulin levels in your body. In many respects, it could potentially cause an elevation in your free T3 and free T4 levels. And this may make you feel um, have perhaps a little bit jittery, maybe a little bit more irritable, maybe trembling, uh, in, inward trembling. Maybe you're having hair loss, maybe you're having heart palpitations. Maybe you just feel agitated, right? Or just again, irritability. Um, Again, all signs of, of uh, hyperthyroidism or just a little bit too much thyroid hormones in your body. The problem with this is, especially for women that have too much testosterone, is that that excess testosterone and the effects that it has on your thyroid binding globulin leads to something called thyroid resistance. And uh, you'd actually have the symptoms of hypothyroidism despite having normal or even high normal levels of that free T3 and free T4. So it can show up in a number of different ways. But again, this is something that I want you to be aware of. So again, if you're taking thyroid replacement alongside testosterone replacement, be sure to have your thyroid binding globulin levels tested as well as your thyroid levels monitored more closely than usual. Now, a lot of doctors only test their patient's thyroid levels maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. So if you start taking any of these medications that I've talked about throughout this video, you want to have your thyroid hormone levels checked more frequently, right? That just makes sense. And remember, thyroid binding globulin is not a routine thyroid marker. Uh, it's only part of a complete thyroid panel. So again, if you're not having a complete thyroid panel, again, you can visit my website and learn more about the different markers that make up uh, what we call and what we refer to as a, as a full thyroid panel. 
Now, before we move on to the next medication, remember Hashimoto's uh, puts you at an increased risk, and, and here's why. Uh, when a person has Hashimoto's, you're already at risk for fluctuating thyroid levels due to the immune system's attack on the thyroid gland. But now if you throw in things like antacid medications because of acid reflux and heartburn, and you have too much testosterone, uh, let's say because you had a testosterone deficiency at one point in time, or maybe you have PCOS, throw in some iron deficiency, throw in some estrogen replacement, throw a birth control pill into this mix, and uh, throw in a weekly use of pain pill or monthly use of pain pills because of, let's say, uh, menstrual cramps or headaches or migraines, throw in some antidepressant medications. And what you have is you quickly see how all these medications begin adding up in throwing just a, a big, you know, big mess into this whole situation of trying to manage and, and, and monitor your, your thyroid levels, right? Your doctor basically have, will have no idea what's wrong with you. And, and all they can do is continue to essentially prescribe you more medications. And that's not going to be the solution to your problem. This is a danger to you, and this, of course, puts you at increased risk for other health problems down the road. You always want to address the root cause of these problems from the very, very beginning, because when you don't, it has this snowball effect. And I've seen this happen, and I've seen this play out in many, many of my patients. You know, this snowball very quickly gets out of control. And again, that's why it's so important to look at the big picture and not just chase thyroid symptoms with, uh, without digging into that root cause, right? All right, so with that being said, the, the next one I want to bring your attention uh, is, is really not a medication uh, or a vitamin. It's actually a mineral, right? And I'm talking about iodine here. And yes, iodine uh, can have many negative consequences on your thyroid gland. While many people talk about iodine deficiency causing hypothyroidism and, and, and high TSH levels, I want you to be aware that excess iodine is equally problematic. And we're starting to see this more and more and more often with patients who are treating themselves and just haphazardly taking iodine because they know they have a thyroid problem. And, you know, again, Dr. Google will say, well, you know, your, your thyroid needs iodine. So people rush out and they start talking to, you know, the clerks at the grocery stores and Whole Foods and these other places, and they start taking supplements with iodine in it. And so while it's true that iodine is needed to make thyroid hormones, very often iodine excess is the, is the side effect, is the result of uh, very often supplementing with iodine. And in the cases of patients that have uh, Hashimoto's, this can be extremely damaging uh, and sometimes irreversible. Again, in hypothyroidism, we have this elevated TSH, we have low T4, we have low T3 levels. Uh, and I see a lot of people, again, just damaging their thyroid because of just too much iodine supplementation. Right? Uh, maybe you read, you read on the internet about iodine loading, so that's something I want to throw out there, uh, iodine loading or the iodine patch test, or you read some articles on the internet that, that basically talk about uh, you know, how important iodine is to the thyroid. Um, again, just one thing I really just want to stress some concern about is that um, you know, iodine can be, can be good, but it can be bad in, in a lot of cases, right? So I hope after today's video, you'll exercise some more caution when it comes to using iodine. Um, so where might you find iodine, right? Where might you be getting exposed to just too much? Well, iodine can come from a number of sources, right? You can get iodine from CT scans and MRIs and other contrast diagnostic imaging. It can come from your thyroid supplements, like I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, sometimes supplements are, are labeled as thyroid boosters. It can come from kelp. Uh, and of course, it can come from your table salt, your iodized salt that's, uh, that you're basically using to salt your steak, to salt your vegetables, uh, put it in your soups, or whatever it is that you use from a cooking perspective. Now, again, like I mentioned just a moment ago, uh, again, worth repeating here is that, um, again, excess iodine has been shown to cause Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And this is when the thyroid gland becomes inflamed. Maybe you're watching this video and you have been having some inflammation in your thyroid. It's time to be more aware that the potential cause for that, uh, of that inflammation in your thyroid gland is caused by that iodine that set into uh, motion that Hashimoto's disease. In fact, Hashimoto's disease is the number one cause of hypothyroidism. Iodine deficiency is not the number one cause of hypothyroidism, all right? So just keep that in mind. Um, here you can see a few studies that show how iodine, uh, you know, even iodine contrast like that that is used in diagnostic imaging can cause inflammation and swelling of the thyroid gland. Um, here's another study showing why you must exercise caution 
uh, and pumping thyroid supplements that contain iodine uh, when you have hypothyroidism. And when it comes to testing iodine levels, uh, overall iodine levels really can't be reliably measured in blood. Um, really the, the most, uh, and that again is just due to the to the, the day-to-day variation of iodine intake. Instead, if you're gonna test your iodine levels, very often what I do is I will use a urinary iodine uh, test, all right? And so again, the moral of the story of this iodine story is that I would advise anyone with thyroid problems or even thyroid symptoms, okay, to exercise caution and really think twice about taking supplements uh, that contain iodine or following someone's recommendations of iodine loading. I can't begin to even tell you over the years how many people have uh, done an iodine loading phase and it was just a bad, bad, bad situation. Again, irreversible damage being caused by that. So the next group of of medications uh, that affect thyroid function uh, and frequently used to reduce allergy symptoms and reduce inflammation in cases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, fibromyalgia, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, asthma, uh, very often used in the treatment of allergies and hives. And these are your glucocorticoids. These are your steroids. Um, These are things like cortisone and prednisone and hydrocortisone. But unlike the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that we just spoke about, um, these again are steroids, right? These are going to affect your immune system. Multiple studies have shown that steroids suppress your TSH levels, these uh, these glucocorticoids. So again, if you're on prednisone, just keep in mind that prednisone can suppress your TSH levels. Other studies have shown that they can impair the conversion of that T4 into T3. This could be cause, this could be a, a common culprit or a cause in terms of why you have low T3 levels. Other studies show that steroids can increase your levels of reverse T3. Now again, reverse T3 is not again one of those traditional markers. Ran uh, it is uh, a, a thyroid marker that's found in a complete thyroid panel. Now the reason reverse T3 is important is that uh, with reverse T3, high levels of reverse T3 uh, are are problematic primarily because reverse T3 competes with your T3. Uh, Essentially what reverse T3 does is it blocks your T3 thyroid hormone from getting into the cell. Uh, And so what I want you to consider here is that while steroids are used to treat the inflammation associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and many other different kinds of autoimmune uh, diseases, they can reduce T4 to T3 conversion. And in doing so, this can exacerbate your hypothyroid state. So again, you could gain weight, you could have more brain fog, more fatigue, hair loss, and all those other things that we've just mentioned. Now, the last thing I wanna mention to you today, uh, when it comes to medications and vitamins that affect thyroid levels is the effect that very often, um, the binders and the fillers that are actually found in thyroid medication uh, and many other medications uh, that you might be taking have on your thyroid, right? This can be something that's very easily overlooked, but throughout this video, we've seen time and time again how medications and even vitamins can cause or create the very problem that we're trying to fix. And so the binders and the fillers that we often see in thyroid medication and many other medications for that matter could be a contributing factor to your thyroid disease. Now, many people with thyroid disease also find themselves suffering with an increased amount of chemical sensitivities as well as food sensitivities and food allergies. So if you can relate to this, you may also be reacting to your daily dose of thyroid medication, right? For some people, within just a few days of taking thyroid replacement, they feel worse. Uh, Maybe they break out in hives. Maybe they become increasingly fatigued or they experience more depression or more headaches or more pain or more maybe their heart begins to race. Um, Many, many other symptoms, again, may not be so obvious, right? But perhaps you're taking thyroid replacement And while you didn't feel worse, weeks uh, right away, weeks later, uh, or maybe even a few days later, you've begun to notice that this medication isn't helping, it's not working. And so when a patient tells me this, one of the things I begin to think, uh, you know, the red flags begin to go off, I begin to immediately think that, hey, this patient could be having an allergic reaction or an intolerance to perhaps one of the binders or one of the fillers uh, that we often see in thyroid medication. And there's a video that I've done on this particular topic where I basically break down the different kinds of medications, um, what they have, whether it be corn or, um, you know, gluten or um, dairy, because again, these are, are again, are, are problematic. So if this scenario is, is uh, familiar to you, 
contact my office and we can help you get tested for either food allergies, food sensitivities, or, or sometimes even both. Um, again, the most common allergies and sensitivities in people with thyroid disease and Hashimoto's are going to be things like dairy and corn and gluten. So again, while there are many, many other foods that you could be sensitive to, these are the ones that become especially important because these are the ones that are found in most medications, they're found in most thyroid formulations. And again, if you're someone that is taking uh, this day in, day out, you can imagine why you're not getting better, right? This can be another one of those things, one of those missing pieces uh, of your thyroid puzzle, right? Now, if you suspect or have a problem with any of these, again, watch that video that I did that reviews thyroid medications, binders, and fillers. And of course, if, if you absolutely need to take thyroid medication, then watch the video I did that reviews the different kinds of thyroid preparations. There's a lot of good video and uh, information in those videos. And again, um, if you, at the end of this video, if you check out the description box, I will uh, try to remember to leave a link in that, um, in that video so that you can go back and you can watch those videos. All right, so that's gonna wrap up today's video. I hope you learned a few things. Uh, if you like today's video, make sure to comment below, hit the notification button, and remember, when it comes to tackling the root cause of poor thyroid function and autoimmunity, it's so much more than just looking at your thyroid levels and, and playing the hormone replacement game, right? Your doctor needs to be a good investigator. They need to run the proper testing. They need to be, you know, again, they need to investigate the reason and get a handle on many of the things that can affect your thyroid uh, lab markers, uh, like we talked about today. It's too easy to be over-medicated in this day and age, especially if your doctor really doesn't look at anything more than your TSH and your T4 levels, right? If your doctor's not looking at the root cause, um, you're going to suffer, right? And so will you let your doctor allow you to suffer is the question, right? Don't settle for thyroid replacement unless you've exhausted all other approaches. Um, again, keep in mind that you can't fix something if you don't know what's causing it. Uh, so again, tackle that thyroid disease with that big picture approach that I, that I talk so often about. The more clues you have about what's wrong within your body, the easier it is to actually fix what's going on and, and support your body so your body has the best chance at healing, right? Get to the root cause of why your thyroid's failing um, and if you feel like you are just one of those people that's just fa uh, falling through the cracks of patient care, even if your thyroid levels are, are, you know, are normal or if they're all over the place and you're still struggling, visit my website. Learn more about my approach and really how we do things and why we're different. So with that, I'll leave this video to a conclusion and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And hopefully you'll join us in the next upcoming videos. Take care.